Man, y'all may be seated. I have a, a bunch of questions here that I'll try and slowly uh, make my way through here. Um, first, it says, uh, when Jesus teaches how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 9 to 14, is this prayer sufficient for daily prayer? Uh, can you please explain? And so, um, obviously, um, the prayer in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 9 to 24, is often called uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name prayer. Um, a lot of scholars would call it the model prayer because really the, the, the idea is that Jesus isn't necessarily trying to teach us that this is how you should pray every single day, but this is kind of a model of how we should pray. Now, what I would say is this. I would say that... Um, um, Jesus did speak about making sure that we don't end up like the hypocrites who pray with vain repetition. And so the problem with when you write a prayer and then you pray it every day is that it, it could very easily become something you just do uh, with rote without any thinking or, 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 or connection. You have to realize that prayer is the word that we use uh, for the conversation we get to have with God. So imagine if every time I saw you, I said, hi, how are you? And he said, good, how are you? I'm doing great. The weather's beautiful today, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, good to see you. Do we really have a good relationship? No, really. I'm just telling you the same thing every day, right? And so I think, but I don't also think simultaneously. What you have is that in some Christian traditions, all they do is pray the Lord's Prayer, and they do that every day. And then in other traditions, all they do is do extemporaneous praying, and they think that it's somehow not spiritual to actually like, write a prayer to pray. And, uh, and I think the key is, is um, I think we should use all of it if it draws us closer and deeper in a relationship with God. So uh, I'm kind of not one of those people who are just going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. It's like um, there's times when I'll literally just pray the Our Father prayer, and I'll pray it, and I'll try and worship God through it. I don't want to just do it in vain repetition, but I think that if I prayed that prayer every day, I wouldn't feel like I'm really having a deep relationship with God. I'm just talking at God. And I think don't miss the fact that in prayer— there is also, um, it's a dialogue. So if there's going to be a monologue in prayer, let's let God be the one monologuing and let us be listening as opposed to us be monologuing in God's direction. So, um, but, but great, great question. Um, why were only the women who had known a man intimately killed were the others not involved in the temptation? And so, so the implication would be, would be that uh, a girl who had not known a man intimately, if, if she was involved in the temptation of the children of Israel, Baal Peor, they, they, that would have, they wouldn't have ended up having uh, sexual intercourse at that point. And so um, the idea is that a, a, a girl who had not known a man uh, would, by implication, have not been involved in, in the um, debauchery at uh, Baal Peor. So that, good question, though. Um, why were the female children spared and the male children killed? Um, when it was the woman who led the Israelites astray in the first place. So um, the idea is, again, it would be common for the male children to grow up and, and want to do a vendetta killing, and that's the reason why. And the female children, they could, um, they could marry I into the community. And so, um, and then the next question is, I wonder who got Balaam's donkey? <laughs> this is a great, that's a great question. And, and to be honest with you, I wonder who got Balaam's donkey too. And you guys know I have a, a rule in the Bible, that when the Bible remains silent, then we should be also. So God knows who got Balaam's donkey. And all I really wonder is if that donkey actually spoke to whoever the new owner was. So, <laughs> Great question. Um, so I got that one already. Um, I am currently very comfortable with my life and very optimistic about my future. How can I learn to depend on God more instead of depending on myself for my future? God is definitely in the big picture in my life, but what can I do to desire him and choose him throughout my day? So, okay, so first, praise God that you feel comfortable and optimistic about your future. Like, I, I want to say praise God because I don't want you to take that for granted because I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who's like, Lord, come on, what about me? You know, like, I don't know who wrote that, but man, I want to be them right now. And so, so, and I think it's a beautiful question because I think learning how to trust God, learning how to depend on God, learning how to worship God is, isn't circumstantially specific. And I think if, you, if you're in a deep valley right now and things are not going well and you're not optimistic and you're uncomfortable, we have to learn how to praise God and depend on him in the midst of it. And if we are optimistic and comfortable and blessed, then we have to learn how to 
praise God in the midst of that. So wherever we find ourselves, we're all learning how to depend, how to trust God. And I think when your things are going well, the issue is always you want to trust in that that everything's going to work out because you have a solid job and you're happy with all the, the circumstances. And so um, the problem is the, the, the idolatry of the heart that wants to trust other things other than the Lord. And when you don't have anything or when you're really struggling, it's really easy to trust God because everything else that was worth trusting isn't working. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic. And so I think the idea is, is um, you say God is definitely in the big picture in my life. I would say um, make him be the picture. Don't let him be... Um, a prop in the picture. And I think that's really, the Christian life is learning how to let God be everything, no matter what the circumstances are. How, does God, how, how do we look at every single day like the Apostle Paul who said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so um, throughout your day, I think not only um, spending time in the word and prayer, I think going out of your way to serve others, going out of your way to be generous, I think in a lot of ways, I talked about it this weekend, like those steroids for spiritual growth. I think so often um, we have to keep pushing it, pushing the pedal down a little harder. And, uh, and, and so I'm always trying to find ways. Lord, how can I go out of my way to, to worship during the day? How can I go out of my way to spend more time in prayer during the day? How can I, when I see someone with a need, if I can, how can I be more available during the day? And so I think the key is just to keep saying, Lord, Open my eyes so that I can see you throughout this day and simply respond to you and um, just see what God does next. So um, great question, though. Um, do you think there are physical healings today? And if so, why do we not see more of them? So the answer is I do absolutely think that there are physical healings today. Why, do not, why don't we see more of them? I think we don't see a, them. We don't see them with as much frequency in the West if you've ever served or uh, been in uh, countries that don't have the gift of uh, Western medicine, you see a lot more of it. And I think the reason we do is because we don't see more of them is because we have so many other things to trust. I mean, who needs to trust God to heal you? We just go to the doctor and they'll give you an antibiotic. You know what I mean? And so it, it ends up, we live in a therapeutic culture, which isn't a bad thing. It's like if you get a headache, you can go get a Tylenol or an Advil or whatever. I mean, I don't want to, I'm not a doctor, so don't trust me for medical advice. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? But it's like, like, we, we, we could just go to the doctor. We can just go get this thing done or that thing done. Oh, my tooth hurts. I'll get a root canal or whatever. You know what I mean? And, but when you have those things, when something goes wrong, the first thing you do is call your doctor, right? Whereas in a country that doesn't have in their first thing is we need to pray because we don't have a doctor. And if God doesn't heal this thing, my teeth are going to fall out or something, you know? And so the key for us is to learn how to be completely dependent on the Lord while we still have all that stuff. You know, and I think that, that becomes a stewardship thing. And so, um, and I, I, I think we also need to remember that sometimes God heals us by taking us home. Sometimes God, sometimes God's answer to our prayer is no. And that's a very complicated thing because most of us just want God to be the big cosmic vending machine who just gives us the Snickers bar every time we put in the quarter of prayer, you know. Sometimes God says no to healing. And I think that's a challenge for us because it's not a question of can God heal. Sometimes he chooses to do things differently than we would have chosen for ourselves. And, and I think sometimes we, we run the risk of saying, because God can heal, he will always heal. And that's not biblical either. God has plans and purposes that are beyond what we can understand. And so that becomes complicated as well. Um... um is homosexuality a sin? Okay, so the answer to that question is yes, it is. Now, I put it out there that yes, it is because, it, you know, I mean, let's not beat around the bush about it, but there's a lot of things in the Bible that are sins. Now, we live in a, uh, up until right now, uh, in the Western cultures, uh, sexual sins were the worst of all types of sins. And within the church, um, same-sex attraction, homosexuality is seen as the worst of the worst kind of sin. Now, your Bible doesn't say that. So uh, it says that pride is a sin. It says that covetousness is a sin. It says that selfishness is a sin. Judgmentalism is a sin. It says that heterosexual sexual immorality is a sin. And so I think the reality is is that um, the Bible teaches that everybody's a sinner. It's just a matter of what uh, type is your inclination. So um, I think the reality is is that um, because the homosexuality question is uh, politically charged, it be feels like it takes on more weight, but... I think there's just as much, 
If you're here and you're heterosexual, you struggle with sexual immorality heterosexually just as much as anybody else. And so the problem with our sexual urges is that when they're removed from the authority of Jesus Christ, we have all sorts of problems. You know, whether it's maybe it's just the lust of your eyes. You know, you're not, do, you're not doing anything but what your heart is doing. Jesus said that, that lust, it's in the heart before it's ever in the action. So um, I think people, you know, people like, oh, I don't like that the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. We probably don't like that there's sexual immorality for heterosexuals. That's a sin too. And we really don't like the fact that pride is a sin, but we all got that. We don't really like that selfishness is a sin, but we all got that, right? And we don't really like that covetousness is a sin. We all got that, but we never admit to it, right? And so we have all these things that God says, no, this is wrong, and this is not who I am, and this is, I want something more for you. And so the key for us, I think, is to not make one category of sins the worst categories. Our job is actually to deal with our own sin. That's what our Bible, our Bible says. We need to deal with our own stuff. We're not actually responsible for everyone else's sin. We're responsible for our own. And if we can be doing the battle, dealing ruthlessly with our own sin, then we might have the moral authority to be able to, in humility, knowing that we are ravaged with sin, but loved by God to be able to, in humility, walk with other people as they're on the journey to acknowledge and agree with God that what they do is wrong and let God do a healing work in them. Does that make sense? So, um, but from cover to cover, people always say that Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. Jesus is the author of the entire Bible. So, you know, so like we, we got to be careful. We have these circular arguments and don't miss the fact that Jesus did all of his preaching within the boundaries primarily of Israel where at that time homosexuality wasn't a common practice at all. But Paul going on out into the Roman Empire, the pagan empire, which didn't, wasn't founded on God's law, it was running rampant. So Paul talked about it a lot more than Jesus. So some of the arguments that people make about these things, it's like, man, you, you're just finding a, you're trying to find a justifiable argument. You're not really thinking logically or historically or critically about the issue. So, but listen, so with me saying that, it does not mean that I hate homosexuals. It does not mean that I am judging them. I'm just agreeing with God that it's what it says. Just the way, I'm not saying that I hate everyone who's proud. I'm not saying I hate everyone who's covetous. I'm not saying that I hate everyone who struggles with heterosexual sexual immorality. You can disagree with somebody and not hate them. Don't ever believe that lie. Think about it. You love your spouse. You love your kids. Do you agree, agree with all of them? Everything they do? I came home today. It was super fun. Oh, but I had a, uh, an apology letter for his sister. Dear Mayor, I'm sorry for kicking you in the butt. You're sorry, brother. Love, Obadiah. That was, I cracked up, you know. It's like, so Obadiah and Maranatha love each other. I'm quite sure Maranatha didn't love getting kicked in the butt by Obadiah. So just because you don't agree with someone doesn't mean you hate them. You know, Lynn loves me. I mean, how could you not? <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Like, but she definitely doesn't love everything I could do, like what I just said. You know what I mean? And so it's like, like, you can love somebody and not agree with them. And we all do that every day. But for some reason on this issue, when you say that, like, oh, you hate everybody. No, just don't agree. Like, I, I have friends who are homosexual, who I love, I don't agree with. They don't agree with the fact that I'm a Christian pastor. So, okay, moving on. Moving on, on. Okay, next. I think I have, what do I, Pastor Daniel, what do you struggle most with as a Christian? Great question. To be super honest, I struggle the most with me. I am my own biggest issue as a Christian because like the Apostle Paul write, writes about in, in uh, Romans chapter uh, 6 and 7, things that I want to do, sometimes I don't do it. I respond the wrong way. My, maybe I respond internally the wrong way. Sometimes I respond externally the wrong way. Uh, I, sometimes I'm grumpy when I should be joyful. Sometimes I'm lacking faith when I know that God, Jesus is real. And so every single day I got my hands full right here, <laughs> Fusco. And so my biggest struggle is with myself and to walk out. The beauty of my calling is that I spend every single day, not only just for job, but for love in the word of God. So I, I can't pretend like I don't know what it says. You know, sometimes I live like I wish I didn't know what it says, but I can't pretend I don't know what it says because I know what it says. And I've counseled people like, hey, this is what it says. And so in some ways I realize how that the standard that Jesus has and what I'm not, I'm not what I used to be and I'm not what I'm gonna be. And so Lord willing, every day I'm just taking the next step and I'm dealing with my own stuff. So that's my biggest struggle as a Christian is me. 
So um, don't hold it against me. God's not done with me yet. Amen. Um, what if your kid just doesn't like youth group? Do you just give up and change churches when you love the teaching here? Um, okay, so this is what I would say. So not every, not every ministry fits every person well. So like, like I realize that there's some people who like, you don't let, your kid doesn't like youth group here or whatever. And so I, we, some, we have some people in youth group, they come into the main service and they like it in here. And so I, I think that in any ministry, you can't make everybody happy. You know, I, I always say that in a church of 100, there's 100 opinions on how things should be. And in a church of thousands, there's a thousands opinions. And so our goal is always to design a ministry that hits the widest swath of people. And I realize that like, when we started reaching a lot of unchristian, non-Christian or new Christians, a lot of the really super Christian people didn't like Crossroads anymore because now all of a sudden they have tattoos and ooh, you know, and like, you know, and it's like, and so you realize that like no matter what you do, there's gonna be people who love it and people who don't love it. And so I would say like, if you love the teaching here and if your kids uh, don't love the, the student ministries, then keep them in the service. If ultimately they don't like being in the service or there, then yeah, maybe you change churches, or maybe you give student ministries another shot, you know what I mean, like, um, so, or maybe you design a small group that kids like your kids would actually like, and you find a way for that to be a part of student ministries, but different from it, I mean, there's a million ways to skin a cat, so to speak, um, even though I've never done it, not once, um, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's like, there's a lot of ways to, to do that. And I think, but ultimately, like, I realize every ministry we do, we're never going to be able to make 100% of people happy. And so I'm sorry about that. And I, a long time ago, I gave up trying. Every decision I make, I realize there's going to be thousands of opinions on it. And, and that's just the way it is. And ultimately, if, if we only make decisions to make everyone happy, we're definitely not going to make the Lord happy because none of us are named Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? And so ultimately to say, Lord, this is who you've called us to be. This is who we're going to be, Lord willing. And, and at this juncture, we're hitting a nice cross section. A lot of people like Crossroads. They call it their home. But if, if I would say that if Crossroads doesn't, uh, doesn't speak and minister to you, the first thing I would ask is, are you actually doing anything other than being a consumer? Because if I always find that people rock the boat that when they're not rowing it. So when someone's like, I'm not, I just feel disconnected from Crossroads. Why are you serving? I'm not serving. That's why you feel disconnected. You've been walking with the Lord so long. You should be doing something other than just sitting there watching other people do everything. The problem is not with the church. The problem is you're lazy. You know, and then people get mad at me. They leave anyway. So, you know, but it's true, right? And so I think that we, we, we live in a culture that always wants to push the blame outward. It's always somebody else. And I think as Christians, we should always say, God, how do I play into this? And what's my side of this? And so, I, I think that helps. I hope. I don't know. If it doesn't help, then sorry. Don't leave. But, yeah, so, but I think there's a lot of different things. You know, I think oftentimes we make the mistake of thinking churches is designed to meet all of our felt needs. When actually the church is designed to be the organic people of God who are growing up into their head. Where we all add what we have to add. And instead of just abandoning it for another church, you know, then you, we need to just roll up our sleeves and get dirty in the life of the church that we're in, you know. And I, I tell, I meet people all the time, like, hey, we're from this other church. I'm like, you should go back there, you know. And I do that because I think too often, like, there's only one church, the church with a big C. And I think too often we're always looking for another place that will give us what we want. And what happens is, is we spend our whole life going from church to church to church because no church is actually designed to give us what we want. It's designed to glorify Jesus and to change us. And most of us leave churches because we don't want to change. And you know what? God loves you too much to want to keep you that way. So he puts you. I always say that I love church because I end up being family members with people who if it was up to me, I'd probably leave. But God wants me to grow through it. He wants me to learn how to love, how to be humble, how to apologize, how to apologize even if I don't think I did something wrong because somebody got hurt. Because somebody needs to take the, the lowest seat in the process. And, you know, if you just kind of cut bait and run when something happens you don't like, you just miss out on all that stuff. And you find that, yeah, I just kept changing churches, but I never became more like Jesus. What a bummer. What a bummer. And so, but I realized that church will only be perfect when Jesus comes back. Until then, we're in the process of becoming. And, and I always tell people, man... It's messy in the body of Christ. 
when I invited Pastor G to be on our staff, I'm like, are you ready to be in the bowels of the people of God? <laughs> you know, I, I, did I say that, Pastor G? And it's like, I want to make, like, because it's like, it's, when you're in the work of people, it's like everyone's got their stuff, everyone's growing, and it's stinking messy sometimes, you know? And, but, like, but God's people find themselves there in the, in, in the mess of it all, trying to see the Lord and see that God's not done with any of us yet. And so um, my prayer is that all of us would find ourselves in the bowels of the people of God, just like all the way in it with our sleeves rolled up, with our hearts bowed and our necks bowed and our hands up in worship, willing servant hands that say, God, we're a mess, Lord, but you love us. And how cool is that? And you're working on us. So I hope that helps. So listen, let's all stand for the benediction. Don't forget, sign up for VBS for your kids or to serve there. And man, come this weekend. God's doing so much fun stuff on our weekends. It's the God's Tweet series is a blast. So let's bow our heads and our hearts for the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Listen, if you have kids in kids church, go get them or else we're gonna give them coffee and you'll be able to deal with them all night. God bless you guys.